afternoon and welcome to today's Way Forward Workshop Leader Lunch Break, where we are thrilled, <clears throat> excuse me, to welcome Greg Harris to the conversation. The unique blend of baseball and music seems to be a part of Greg Harris's DNA. Both have always captivated him. At the age of 20, he co-founded the Philadelphia Record Exchange, a place for hard to find vinyl, then sold the business and traveled cross country as road manager for Ben Vaughn. Not quite sure about the transition, but it was while playing baseball that he had a chance encounter with the librarian for the National Hall of Baseball Hall of Fame. Somehow that meeting led to a job at the Hall of Fame and he quickly worked his way to a senior executive and served there for 14 years. Along the way, he earned a master's in museum studies. He found the perfect blend of his love of music and museums in 2008 when he came to Cleveland and assumed the role as Vice President of Development at our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and again was quickly elevated to President and CEO in 2013. His passion for work and his firm belief in the power of museums to teach is evident in his redesign of the Rock Hall and the new construction that's currently underway. A board chair called him a relentlessly enthusiastic worker, and his former business partner from the Philadelphia Record Exchange described him as someone who can always get people to do stuff, a rock star without a band. His role may seem like a rock star, and perhaps it is, in that it is simultaneously exhausting and exhilarating. While he rubs elbows with the greatest musicians of all time, he is also the target for the criticism that comes with the announcement of the incoming Hall of Fame class. He manages both with resilience and aplomb. We are thrilled to have him join us today. And at the Leadership Center, we're thrilled to call him an alum. Thank you, Greg. Uh, well, thank you, Mary Ann. Boy, that was a terrific intro. Um, and I, I appreciate that you, you dug in and, and found some of those, uh, those pieces of the journey. And it's one of those that I think everybody here can relate to. You sometimes do things um, throughout your life, especially as you're building your career, and it feels like you're zigzagging. But then when you look back, it's a perfectly straight line. It all fits together. And uh, that was my my case, um, is that I, I use things that I learned in the running an independent record store 30-something years ago um, in making sure that this... Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame feels authentic, that it uh, impacts um, our guests, our visitors, and that we can continue to grow our audience. And you have to be authentic. And there's nothing more authentic than an independent record store, especially if you're sleeping in the back and selling your own collections to get the business off the ground. Uh, I'm pleased to say that store still exists. My original partner still has it. And they're approaching, um, God, uh, I it'll be the 40th anniversary next year. Uh, which is remarkable for any business, but for an independent record store, it's a it's a whole nother level. And uh, you know, as as Marianne mentioned, um, you know, the museum is a place that's in in ch change mode, but we're kind of always in change mode, and that's how um, we like it. That's how we prefer it. As you may, many of you may realize, that maintenance mode for any space, uh, you might do it for a little while, but ultimately, uh, you can't be in maintenance mode. You have to be in growth mode. You have to be in change mode. Um, otherwise, um, uh, you uh, you you wither uh, eventually from being in maintenance mode. It's just the way it is. So uh, I know that I was asked to, to talk to everybody today. Uh, um, pretty wide open invitation for uh, what we can uh, discuss. And uh, I know that the induction ceremony was one of the items that um, it was suggested would be of interest in. You know, we have a great induction class this year. We announced it uh, back in April and there's going to be 16 artists honored. And, you know, you can Google it if you'd like, but it's Mary Blige, Cher, the Dave Matthews Band, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, Cool and the Gang, Ozzy Osbourne, A Tribe Called Quest, Jimmy Buffett, the MC5, Dionne Warwick, Norman Whitfield, Suzanne DePass, Big Mama Thornton, finally, uh, and great British blues artist John Mayall and Alexis Corner. And it's a... It's an exciting time for Cleveland because the inductions are on a rotation where they're, they're, they weren't here for the first 17 years of our existence. We had them once. And when I came over in 08, one of the charges was to bring the inductions here more frequently. So we did it in 09. We did it in 12. We did it in 15. We did it in 18. 
we had a little interruption in there um, before 20, so we did it in 21. And um, now it's back again in 24, and we're back on cycle. But um, the induction ceremony itself, it's, you know, it's a world-class ceremony. It gets broadcast on ABC as a primetime show, um, an edited show. But as it happens, it will be broadcast live on, uh, on Disney Plus and then streamed on Hulu. And the ratings and the pickup and everything is just massive. But the other piece of it is, is that the inductions fill hotel rooms in Cleveland. They create, um, they help um, um, pay for Ubers and pay for cars and pay for restaurants and um, places that we get our, our merchandise from and other uh, event companies, um, artists and creatives that perform that week for our shows, uh, people that are employed in service industries. And the economic impact of the inductions is about $50 million every year. But that joins our annual economic impact of roughly $240 million annually to Northeast Ohio. And when you really tease that out, and uh, I believe that's a modest um, mo multiplier because it's $140 million in direct spend. Our visitors spend for hotels, again, all the other places. And we might get a, a $30 five dollar museum ticket but the hotels are getting three hundred dollars worth of room of room nights and the restaurants are getting uh, bills that are larger than that and and people's cost for being here and, and shopping so that aggregate economic impact is about 240 million a year add another 50 million when the inductions are in cleveland and uh suddenly you've got a lot of um a lot of dollars flowing into the community i might add one other important note that um 85% of our visitors throughout the year come from outside of Northeast Ohio, outside of a three hour drive time. So when we talk about these economic numbers, it's new money coming into our community that isn't just being recirculated. Um, some places really cater in a big way to, to regional and local visitors. And it's it, they're important places and we need them and they're important to our, to our lives. But on the economic impact number, it's just the same dollars kind of flowing around or this is new dollars into our community. And then for induction over 90% will come from outside the region. And it does have a measured strong impact. Um, you know, that's a little bit of our, our outside uh, impact and how people come in. One of our mantras is to try and get out of towners to pay for everything so the locals get it for free. Um, and uh, we are open um, 363 days a year. And we are free to Cleveland residents 363 days a year. Um, we, um, uh, thanks to the support of, uh, of Key Bank, they helped us do this. And it's been a, a great program, one that we want to continue to grow. And in fact, one that we look to you to help us communicate uh, to anybody that you're working with that is a Cleveland resident. Um, we also have programs for anybody getting public assistance, uh, whether it's um, uh, the SNAP food program or other things doesn't matter where they live, um, those people are also um, free into the museum uh, every day, all the time. Um, we do a lot of community programs at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, including live music all summer long. Uh, it's a great place to be at the lakefront where the sun's setting with our outdoor stage. And we, we, put, we don't really hire party bands that play great cover songs. We hire original artists. And those original artists... Uh, are frequently from Northeast Ohio or regional. And then, you know, once a week, we'll bring in national acts and they'll play on our plaza with support from local acts and, and others. And in fact, um, you know, I know there's um, a, a ballot initiative coming for the CAC, um, for the, um, the, the cigarette tax that supports art and culture in Northeast Ohio. And uh, we are a beneficiary of that. We're incredibly grateful. Um, we have found that almost 70% of what we collect from that goes back into the hands of artists uh, that are performing at our place, uh, whether they're doing it at our, our events or if they're performing uh, at one of the 230 private events that we did at the museum in the last year. Uh, it's a vibrant, thriving place. And, um, and we like, um, again, um, doing that for the community and making sure we can deliver on it. Um, like every great museum, and I see Sonia out there with a great museum at University Circle, uh, the uh, Natural History Museum, please visit it. The, the renovation expansion looks terrific. Um, we bring um, local students to our museum and CMSD students are the majority of them. Um, we um, Just before COVID, we were up to around 20,000 a year. 
Uh, we're crawling, clawing back. We're over 10,000 in the last year. And for those students, we look to the community to help make it happen. Uh, we found a real gap that CMSD didn't have field trip budgets to get the students here. So we we raise the funds and we pay for all the buses to bring all the students here and kind of take that off the table. We have another program we're quite proud of that's called Toddler Rock. And Toddler Rock takes students from local Head Start programs. And Head Starts are frequently in um in, in, in neighborhoods that uh, uh, are really fertile for um, uh, improvement and growth and development. And these students are coming from these Head Start programs. We bring them to the museum every Tuesday and Thursday for 15 weeks. And we teach rhyming alliteration and social skills. Um, and uh, our cohort cohort right now is close to 800 students. The teachers that teach these are, are trained music therapists from University Hospital, uh, as well as from the Beck Center um, out on the west side. And we teach them rhyming alliteration and social skills through music. And we've done this program for 25 years. Uh, we've had, I believe, when you add it all up, close to 10,000 students. And in addition to what they learn, what I really think is another spin out of it is that all of those students can look at this pyramid here on the lake where many think that's where all the tourists go. And they can say that I have a part of that. I studied there, I learned there, I had great experiences there and I'm part of this city. Um, so that's Toddler Rock. And then of course we offer all of our digital offerings online. Um, through um, in Spanish and in English, and they're used by teachers all over the world. And we, last year, we reached, I think, 1.5 million students through online learning. And it's a, it's a great program because you can, you can use it in San Diego, but you can use it in Shaker Heights too. You just need to log on and, um, and take advantage of it. And, and those are all free to teachers as well. Um, I guess I'm, I'm spinning around on, on things. I'm, I'm minding the clock as well. This is a quick meeting and I hope uh, if people are off camera, they're eating and using this time well. Um, but we have a big project going on right now at the lakefront if you've been down this way and it's a 50,000 square foot expansion that we're adding to the museum. Um, the museum is now 30 years old. And in those 30 years, we realized that this pyramid isn't the best shape for a museum. Uh, we love it and it bookends our, our architect that designed it is I am Pei. And as you probably know, um, he also designed the Pyramid at the Louvre, the center of Europe's great art. We are the center of America's great art, rock and roll. And so we love the building, but functionally it's a challenge. Um, to be honest, when I started as CEO over 10 years ago, the staff wanted to expand the building right away. And um, we weren't using the pyramid effectively. So we've spent the last 10 years maximizing every square inch of the pyramid. And uh, we transformed a lot of spaces to feel more immersive, to feel more authentic, a little less like a, um, a cold um, modernist art museum and a little more like a like a loud rock and roll place that you might walk into. So a little more Beachland ballroom or drag shop vibe inside the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And um, but now it's time to expand. So we are um, we've maximized our place. We're adding the 50,000 square feet. It'll include a performance venue, mixed use for events and for shows that can hold up to 1,400 people uh, and be great for parties and events. It'll be right at the lake so lakefront, but indoors. Um, we're moving our offices from where I'm sitting right now in the pyramid to the, to the new addition for two reasons. One, uh, for 30 years, our staff hasn't been able to see out the window. There is, are no windows in our offices. That's a, it's a museum um, issue that everybody has. And um, we're sitting on this beautiful lake and we think it will be good for their well-being to be able to see outside. Um, but we're also, exhibits love not having sunlight. So we're going to convert our office space into exhibition space and it's going to increase our main exhibit hall by 40%. And it allow us to tell bigger stories in, um, in these galleries and, and bring in more changing exhibits and, and, um, and be able to uh, just um, have a better impact on our visitors and a better experience. Um, others things in the expansion, it's going to allow Northeast Ohio residents to get close to the lakefront. We are, uh, we've changed the park next door. It's going to be less than 5% grade to go from lakeside to the water. And we're partnering with the Metro parks to operate that, um, and then connect it to their 55th street, the bike paths that are coming down and will be the terminus of those. 
And you can also experience the lake from being inside the expansion. It's a big glass open space. No ticket is required. You can come in uh, in the middle of winter and be in a warm spot with music playing and, and see outside, or you can come in the summer and be in air conditioning um, and hopefully grab a bite to eat off of one of our food trucks and um, come into our museum, but you don't need a ticket. And if you're a Cleveland resident, as noted, you don't need one anyway. But um, that's a, a little bit of what's happening. And um, I'm, I'm watching the clock, uh, Marianne and Rachel, you know, I can keep going or we can take questions or um, what would you what would you like? Uh, I can give us a sort of a state of our, of where we are as a business. Um, but I'm, I'm, I just want to uh, be mindful of what, where you would like this to go. Sure, Greg, this is this has been great to kind of get an overview of all that's happening. So why don't we dive into the questions? So we know that the ceremony is often what we see and it's all over streaming and on TV, but so much of there beyond that is the corresponding exhibits that come to the Hall of Fame. So can you talk a little bit more about the cultivation of those exhibits? And as you look at this year's class, who are you most excited to feature? Super. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, we talk about the induction cycle and the induction cycle really starts in January when the nominating committee meets. And it's about 30 people, maybe 26. Um, and we meet face to face. I'm fortunate to be a member of the nominating committee. There's some musicians on it. Um, Quest Love from The Roots is on it. Dave Grohl from The Foo Fighters. Um, few, Steve Van Zandt from Springsteen's E Street Band. And then some historians and media personalities that are rock and roll experts. And we each nominate two. And then there's a series of voting in the room and we come up with a ballot. And the ballot then goes out to all the other living inductees. So, um, you know, uh, when, when the ballot is mailed, um, you know, it, it goes out and uh, Lionel Richie gets a ballot. Bruce Springsteen gets a ballot. Um, Little Anthony gets a ballot. The members of Metallica and the Red Hot Chili Peppers all get ballots. And that's the biggest voting block. And then some other writers and uh, media people and historians get it as well. When all the ballots come back, the top vote, five vote getters are elected. Uh, this year, um, there was a log jam for fourth and fifth. And we ended up going with uh, seven instead of five. And that's where we picked up Mary Blige, Mary J. Blige, Cher, the Dave Matthews Band, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, Cool and the Gang, Ozzy Osbourne, and a tribe called Quest. Then there's some committees that meet that look at musical excellence, and that's where we picked up the other uh, inductees. So once all that is is known, uh, it's announced. Uh, we connect with the the artist himself, uh, with their management, um, and uh, we let them know what's coming. That we're going to be collecting artifacts for our exhibit. We change the exhibit every year at the museum. Uh, we want their help with social media. Uh, we want their approved photos to use uh, and their partnership including um, retail licensing, where we'll do co-branded product together and help promote it. So all that stuff gets underway now, quite frankly. Um, most of these artists are now featured in our store. Um, we're doing shares on social with each other and our curators are scheduling um, meeting with them. Now the challenge is this, there's 16 of them. So we really only need a couple important pieces from their career. And it's really hard for them to think of what those pieces might be. And ideally we want, um, you know, some iconic stage outfit uh, in a perfect world. You know, if we're doing an exhibit about the Jefferson airplane and we want Grace Slick's vest that she wore at Woodstock, not just any vest, but that one. And uh, we want those things to tell these bands story uh, and create that connection with our visitors because you can't just explain everything you want people to see things that bring that sort of unleashes their own collective memory of that that record cover, that specific image, you know, or um, that specific moment when they went coast to coast for some reason. So we start collecting from them. Um, there's a little dance with who's going to induct who, and we have a show producer. This is a major budget television production that's kind of made for TV. So you would look at the list of people and think um say with share it's a chance for us to to one bring some um energy and youth to the show by having some of the younger female artists that she influenced 
uh, perhaps induct her. You might remember um, in 2021, if you were at the induction, when Carol, Key, Carol King was inducted, great songwriter and performer, um, Taylor Swift did it. And so we kicked off our show with Taylor Swift performing, and she gave an incredible induction speech for um, Carol King, then they played together. But then in all the marketing for the show, you need to watch the, the broadcast. Back then it was on HBO featuring Taylor Swift. You know, suddenly it's a, it, 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 it just increases your impact. Um, and it also um, allows them to honor the artist in a bigger and better way. So collecting is well underway. And it is a question of finding stuff that tells a story. Um, and then um, uh, the curators are work their magic. We have an in-house designer that does that work. We have curators on staff. They all have specialties. Somebody might be a specialist in 80s rock and roll, uh, you know, from the flock of seagulls to the replacements to uh, um, hip hop and R&B from that era, whereas others might be stronger in the 90s or 2000s or the 60s or 70s. And when will those exhibits be available for the public to attend? Yeah. So right now, we still have last year's class up. So last year's class uh, was honored um, in New York in November, and the show broadcast on January 1st on ABC. So they're up right now. We're collecting, and we'll have the other exhibit open. It won't open this summer. It'll open in, the, um, in October before the induction. The induction is October 19th. However, um, today is Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, on Saturday, we opened up a brand, a brand new exhibit on the sixth floor of the museum, um, celebrating the band Bon Jovi's 40th anniversary. And John Bon Jovi and band were with us all day Saturday. Um, hopefully you saw the media pick up from it. It was pretty strong. And um, that'll be one of our featured exhibits all summer long. The other one is the 50th anniversary of hip hop. We opened it last year, was the 50th, but we've kept it up. It's just too good to take down. Has so many incredible artists. And we opened another exhibit um, in April on International Women's Day. We opened up a, an exhibit called Revolutionary Women in Music. And it's essentially um, a way to bring the a more modern story in uh, to the museum. And it's, it's powerful um, female voices from Patti Smith to the present. And it cuts across all genres. They could be, um, you know, hard rock it could be hip-hop it could be r&b uh they're all in there from Sinead o'connor to beyonce um to bikini kill um and um and marilyn manson of garbage just a great exhibit speaking of your exhibits how often do you change exhibits in the museum yeah. you know the general rule is typically we run stuff for a year um, but that year means we want it up for the summer season. You know, we're, we're going to have over 500,000 visitors this year. And um, I think we're, we're up to almost 200 now. And then this summer, uh, we'll get another, you know, 250. And then things slow down around the holidays. So we want to open exhibits in the spring and want to keep them through the holidays. Uh, that's the goal. And then occasionally you make a pretty big capital investment and you decide to keep it for another cycle. And that was the case with the 50th of hip hop. We're keeping it for a second cycle. We recently had a Beatles exhibit um, all about their final um, sessions for the um, uh, Let It Be and Get Back. It was tied to the Peter Jackson docuseries. We kept that for two years as well because it was a big investment uh, and, and wildly popular even the month it came down. Speaking of the, the many community programs you do, especially with the schools, why is it important for Clevelanders to support the Rock Hall and the teaching and learning around music? Yeah, um, you know, all museums, right, are, are educational institutions. And it's not just for school groups. It's for school groups and but anybody walking through our exhibits is learning about themselves. They're learning about, um, uh, you know, social justice. They're learning about the voices of change. Um, and um, maybe they're learning about how stuff stays the same from era to era, um, for better or for worse. And um, so it's important for us to continue to remind people that these everything we do has to be through that lens of learning. And for us, it gets a little cloudy because 
if you're doing a benefit uh, event for the Cleveland Clinic and you put a band on stage, that's entertainment. If we're doing an event on our plaza and we put a band on stage, that band is delivering music, which is rock and roll, which is our mission. <laughs> so that's why we we go with original artists and we want them to bring it. Um, on the school groups, you know, these are incredible learning places. Um, museums are um, have th this power to teach and inspire because you are around, um, you know, the original artifacts, the objects themselves, um, or in cases of, of other places, uh, you know, whether it's, it's, it's the images and the graphics and other things, but you can, you can sort of bring things alive. And we have that extra magic of introducing music. And if we can be talking to students um, about um, subjects that are, that are important and somehow it gets reinforced by what they're listening to and draw those connections, you know, we have an education module that links um, artists like Kendrick Lamar today uh, to his lyrics are almost the same as it, it, the same vein as Bob Dylan's lyrics uh, in calling for change and calling out injustice and, and reasons why. And so if we can make those connections, maybe uh, it helps them listen to other things differently and helps inspire them differently. So, you know, we, um, we have an incredible platform. We have to use it. Um, we also teach things like the history of technology and we have a financial literacy course where students break up and they form a band and they decide if they're going to buy a van and go on the road or if they're going to spend money on, you know, TikTok marketing or print up CDs or what they're going to buy or t-shirts. And then we run all these, you know, random generate some numbers and find out if they made a gazillion dollars or if they're, they owe their record label $50,000 um, and, um, and they've got no gigs lined up. So we do things like that. We have a, a technology, the science of sound, where we use our subject to help explain something that fits into the, the core curriculum uh, standards of uh, the state at the right time and place. And so teachers sign up for things like that. Um, and uh, just exposing people to uh, different ways of learning and, um, and engaging them. Do you think about the inductions and who's been in recently? Is there someone who's not in yet that you would advocate for? You know, and that's the classic question from the, the the big rock and roll radio stations when you go on your media tours and do lots of interviews, because it's a controversial question, right? And the way I usually answer it is I say, you know, today is the day we're celebrating the new class. And, uh, and let's give them the spotlight. Let's not talk about who isn't in. Let's talk about who actually is getting in this year and why it's a great honor to them. And, um, you know, that's... When I first started here, I would think through and uh, think, boy, uh, at the time, uh, Tom Waits wasn't inducted. I, I love Tom Waits. I thought he would be an interesting one. Um, you started thinking about the the bands that, um, uh, that, that mattered to you. And by and large, most of them have now been inducted. And it had nothing to do with, with me. It was just the right time and the right place. And it, these things evolve. And when you look at the artist in this year's class, um, Peter Frampton had never been nominated before. He finally got nominated, he got in. Cher hadn't, hadn't been nominated. She's been making music for 60 years. Uh, finally got nominated and is going in. Uh, a Tribe Called Quest were nominated three times. Finally got enough votes to get in. And they belong. Every single one of them belongs in. Big Mama Thornton, she inspired Elvis, you know, arguably should have been inducted 30 years ago in our first couple classes, but was just kind of lost to the, um, um, lost on the people doing the evaluation, lost on us, um, but thankfully resurfaced and uh, is be giving her, her her recognition that she, that she does deserve. So sometimes it does take a while. There are certain genres of music that have created log jams there was a, a, a moment in our history when progressive rock bands like um, Yes and Rush and Genesis were all splitting the vote. And then one was nominated and they got in and the next was nominated and they got in and the Moody Blues had been waiting 27 years for nomination. Um, and they finally got nominated and they went in instantly. So that tends to happen. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's a big net. People frequently ask why, how do you, how do you define rock and roll? For us, it's all about attitude and spirit. Um, and that includes, 
you know, music was never one sound. Rock and roll has always been broad and diverse. Um, so you can have rockabilly and uh, soul music and, and punk rock and industrial music and heavy metal and dance music. And yes, disco is great soul music and Donna Summers and others, uh, Ma Rogers are inducted and they should be. And hip hop is rock and roll. It's the strongest voice of this generation. And um, it has attitude, it has spirit. And we've inducted well over, I guess, a dozen plus hip hop artists. And um, we're, you know, it's it's wide open. What's great is we actually receive fewer um, complaint messages about people being in or people being out. And um, there are, there's a great, used to be a great public debate, is that rock and roll? That seems to have melted away. Um, and um, for a long time, it was out there and it really surfaced people's own um, bias toward the music that they grew up with and not anybody else's. And um, thankfully that is, um, I believe, um, lessened. And um, we just love this class and, and we love that it can be this diverse. Well, if you're looking for recommendations, uh, your fellow LC classmate would like to put in a vote for Weird Al Yankovic in the future. So, you know what? His his fan base is crazy, is wildly loyal, and frequently he's like the, the only artist they listen to. It's it's a it's a singular thing, and it's so great. Um, I know it's not the the same level, but um, we're honoring. Um, a fellow from Cincinnati that sadly passed away that um, has the same satirical approach to, to the world. And um, really it's great political commentary and, and satire. It's Mojo Nixon. And we're honoring him today uh, with an exhibit case. And uh, they, they actually did a proclamation at the state house in Columbus yesterday, uh, making it Mojo Nixon day in the state of Ohio. So it, it's, it's out there, but um, uh, Weird Al has never been nominated. So, um, he's not been eligible to be elected yet, but he's eligible to be nominated. I think you have your marching orders, Tony. Greg, thank you so very much for uh, this truly enlightening conversation. Unfortunately, there's so many questions that were coming in that we just did not have time to address. So hopefully we'll have a chance to get those answered in the future. And we're grateful for the gift of your time and all that you are doing for the Rock Hall, for rock music, and for Cleveland to help our economic development. Many thanks. Whoops, you're muted. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to join you. And um, I, uh, I appreciate the chance to talk about something that's, I believe, incredibly important for Cleveland. And um, we are, you know, I, I gave you sort of a lot of our internal perspective, but also that we work with so many people around town. We partner with Destination Cleveland, um, with Greater Cleveland Partnership with others when we're pitching big citywide events like the draft and the NCAA Final Four, um, Women's Final Four and all those things. And, and we love doing that. Um, and I'd encourage everybody that's part of this to keep working together. Um, keep, um, you know, we, we um, it's one of the hallmarks of this city and it's something that doesn't happen everywhere else. And it allows us to really punch above our weight and deliver big things. And I'd be remiss if I didn't see, because we do have Tony, uh, Brancatelli over there, uh, one of my classmates in the best class ever in 2010 uh, for Leadership Cleveland. And if there's others on this call, I apologize. Um, but um, uh, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to seeing everybody around Cleveland. And, and thanks for all you do uh, to make this, this city better.